about any of the material that we've covered so far? All right, so what we've, we've talked about, so far we've talked about the, the how mutations can arise in bacteria, and we talked about the ways that bacteria can transfer these, these genes from one cell to another cell, even, even across species. Uh, what we want to talk about now, today, is the uh, regulation of gene expression in bacteria. You know, bacteria are, are very, very efficient organisms, and if you think about it, they have to be. If you had to divide every 20 or 30 minutes, you need to do things right all the time, okay? And so bacteria are actually very efficient, and so they don't express all the genes that they have if there's no reason for, for, for using the product of that gene. So, for example, if a, if, if a cell if there's no lactose in the environment, there's no reason for the, for the cell to turn on all those genes that are required for lactose utilization. And of course, then they don't. And similarly, if a cell finds itself in the presence of a lot of tryptophan, there's no reason to turn on those genes, okay? So it doesn't. And so what we're going to talk about today is then how this cell measures, senses its environment then, and expresses the genes that are needed for whatever environment that, that cell happens to find itself in. And this does not only apply, we're going to talk about steps in intermediary metabolism, the lactose system and the tryptophan system, only because these are the, the, the model prototype systems. But keep in mind that this does not just apply to these systems that we're talking about. The same thing applies to antibiotics. If, if uh, let's say that a cell has an antibiotic resistance gene. If the antibiotic is not present in the environment, there is no sense for the cell to express that gene. It only needs to express that gene when the antibiotic is there. And that's what you see, that, that, that these genes all, very often will get expressed only when the antibiotic is present, okay? All right, so a couple general comments about uh, control of gene expression in bacteria. And, and we're gonna distinguish them from what happens in eukaryotic systems. First of all, in bacteria, a lot of the regulation occurs at the level of transcription. And that is actually actually true for our cells, too. We don't, we don't make messages unless, uh, unless we're going to translate them. And, and bacteria certainly don't do it uh, also. And if you think about it, it also makes a lot of sense. Every time you make a message, every nucleotide that's incorporated into the message is the equivalent of one ATP worth of energy. So there's no sense making, spending all this energy to make messages if you're not going to translate them. Now that doesn't mean there can't be control at the level of translation. There certainly is. We control at the level of translation, and so do bacteria. But mostly it's control at the level of transcription. And in bacteria, there's a lot of clustering of genes with related activities or related functions. Uh, and again, our cells do that too. We cluster certain genes that, are, that have related functions, but in bacteria it's much more noticeable. The, the genes that are involved in lactose utilization are all closely linked on the chromosome. In fact, they're absolutely adjacent to each other, okay? Uh, and so you see a lot of clustering of genes with related function. And not only are they clustered, they're coordinately regulated. And what that simply means is that one is, when one gene expressed is expressed, they're all expressed. When one gene is turned off, they're all turned off. Now, we do this as well, but it's not nearly as much as you see in the, in the bacteria, where you have this coordinate expression of genes with related function. And the reason that these genes get coordinately regulated is because bacteria make what is known as polycystronic RNAs. And what that means is that this is a RNA that actually encodes, that is, uh, encodes the information from several genes. So it has many different genes on the same piece of DNA, uh, same piece of RNA. Okay, it's a polycystronic message. Now bacteria do this. This is one difference. We don't do this, uh, and the reason is our ribosomes actually can't translate polycystronic messages. Right? It's the way our ribosomes work. And so even if, if we did make a polycystronic message, we could never translate the whole, the whole message. We could, we could only translate the very first gene in that message. It's the way our ribosomes work. But bacterial ribosomes are different. They're able to, to translate polycystronic messages. So if you have a message that has multiple genes on it, 
ribosomes can jump on at different po points on that uh, message and actually translate them into protein. And our ribosomes can't do that. Our ribosomes always have to, have to start at the end of a message and then go on until it reaches the first stop signal. All right. So basically, there are two, two general ways that, that genes are regulated by induction or by repression. And we'll discuss both of them. We'll start with the in induction or the, those genes that are inducible. Uh, and, and by the, the, what these are, these are genes whose expression is turned on by the presence of something in the environment. And the system that we're going to describe is lactose, the lactose uh, utilization system. Obviously, there's no reason for the cell to express these genes that are involved in lactose catabolism if the lactose is not present. But the same applies to the antibiotics, as I said. There's no reason to express a resistance gene unless that antibiotic is present. And so these kind of genes are going to be regulated by induction. Typically, you see these in, in catabolic pathways. These are path pathways involved in the breakdown of, of materials. All right, so how does this lactose system work? And we'll use this again. This is just a prototype. In this system, there are a, a series of what are referred to as structural genes. And the structural genes are the genes that code for the enzymes involved in, in the breakdown of, of some particular substance, in this case, lactose. So in the case of the lactose system, there are three structural genes, the Z, Y, and the A gene. And they're all immediately adjacent to each other on the chromosome. The Z gene codes for the enzyme beta-galactosidase, which, of course, splits lactose into glucose and galactose. Uh, the Y gene codes for a permease. This is, this is a protein that inserts into the membrane, the cytoplasmic membrane, and is involved in transporting lactose across that cytoplasmic membrane into the cell. And the third gene, the A gene, is the transacetylase gene. This, this product, the, the, the galactoside transacetylase, is not actually involved in catabolism of lactose. It has something to do with the regulation. We're not really going to talk about that, that gene, although it is part of this operon. It's not directly involved in catabolism of lactose, just these two, the permeate and the beta-galactosidase. Okay. Now, when these genes are transcribed, they will be transcribed into a polycystronic message that contains the information for all three genes. So it's one big message for all three genes. And then these, the message will be translated into each of these individual proteins. Now, the, the reason that you get, well, let me, the reason that you get this polycystronic message is that there's, there's only one promoter that drives the expression of these genes, and that's sitting right here. So here's the promoter for these genes. And when this, when this when transcription initiates at this promoter, you get the production of this, this messenger, one, this polycystronic message. Now, the expression of these genes is under the control of another gene, which is referred to as the regulatory gene. In the case of the lactose system, it is located right here, right next to the, the promoter. There's no reason why that, that regulatory gene has to be at attached to the rest of the genes. In fact, in most cases, it's not. Uh, it just, in the case of the lactose, it happens to be, and in the case of the lactose, it's called the I gene. It's, it's, and this is for historical region, reasons. This was the first one that was discovered, and it was called the gene that was regulating induction, and that's why it's called the I gene. In most cases, the regulatory gene is referred to as the R gene uh, for the regulatory gene. Well, again, for historical reasons, this one, it, the I designation has remained. And again, there's no reason why it has to be here. In, in the case of lactose, it happens to be, most other cases, it's someplace way distant from the rest of the genes. All right, so this is a gene that is regulating the expression of the rest of these genes. And what it does is it codes for a repressor. In fact, this gene is is transcribed constitutively. It's made all the time. It, it's not regulated. So it, and it codes for a repressor. And what the repressor does, just as we saw in the case of lambda, the repressor binds to another, another site, which is referred to as the operator, which is sitting right there. All right? And when the repressor binds, the transcription is going to be turned off, just like we saw with, with the lambda repressor. When the lambda repressor bound to the, the lambda operator, turned off the genes. When the lac repressor binds to the lac operator, it's going to turn the genes off. Okay. 
And this, this type of regulation is, is the operon model. And the operon actually is the, the structural genes that are being rela uh, regulated, as well as the operator and promoter that are driving, the, that are involved in regulating these genes. It does not include the regulatory gene. The regulatory gene regulates the operon, okay? Uh, so this is the operon from here to there, okay? And of course, this system is, is going to respond to the presence of lactose or the absence of lactose in the environment. So lactose is going to be the inducer that turns on the expression of these genes. So how does that happen? Yes? No. In bacteria, you don't have introns. Bacteria don't, don't process messages that way. Uh, so you don't. These are all actually, this is all a continuous se uh, sequence of, of nucleotides in the, in the DNA, okay? So you don't have introns, okay? All right, so how does this regulation occur? The inducer is going to be lactose. So what's going to happen in the absence of lactose? I will look at that situation first. In the absence of lactose, remember we said the I gene is constitutively expressed, so it's making the repressor all the time. And in inducible operons, the, the, re, the repressor, the product of that regulatory gene, it, when it is synthesized, it is synthesized, it is an inactive conformation. And so the repressor immediately upon synthesis is active. And what it does, its role is to bind to operator. And so the repressor, the active repressor, then binds to the operator, and that blocks transcription initiating from this promoter. So you cannot initiate promoter when that repressor is blocking the operator. And so you get no message being made. And so in the, abs in the absence of lactose, these genes are turned off. We don't need them, the, the products of those genes. And so there's no expression of the gene. Now in the presence of lactose, what happens is that lactose, the inducer, binds to the repressor and inactivates it. So that repressor has got two binding sites. It's got a site for binding to the operator. It's got a site for binding to, to lactose. And so in the presence of lactose, the repressor binds to the, to the, um, the, the lactose binds to the repressor and inactivates the repressor. Well, that, it not only will it inactivate free repressor, it'll also inactivate any repressor that is already bound to the operator and cause it to dissociate from the operator. So we now free the operator. And then that allows transcription to initiate from this promoter and transcribe your polycystronic messenger RNA and you make all the enzymes necessary for for lactose utilization. So in the, in the absence of lactose, the genes will be turned off. In the presence of lactose, the genes get turned on in inducible system. Now this type of control is referred to as, as negative control because the role of the repressor is really to turn off the genes. So it's, that's why it's called negative. The repressor's role is to turn the genes off. All right. Now, let me ask you, what is lacto what does a cell use lactose for? Energy, right? That's what it's going to do. It's going to take the glucose and, and use it in, as for energy. After, after beta-galactosidase beta -galactose splits the lactose into glucose and galactose, the glucose is going to use for energy. The galactose actually gets converted to glucose and then also is used for energy. All right? But what is the preferred energy source for cells? Glucose, right? Because that's what goes through the glycolytic pathway is glucose. So if, if glucose is the preferred source, why would the cell want to use lactose if it, all, if it found itself in the presence of both glucose and galactose? It may as well just use the glucose, right? If it found itself in the presence of both, the cell really wants to use the glucose and is only going to start using the lactose when there's no more glucose around. So somehow, the cell has got to have a way of, of, the, of sensing that there's both glucose and galactose present and utilize the glucose preferentially. And that is a process called catabolite repression. So superimposed on the regulation that we just described for the induction of the lactose genes, there's another level of regulation called catabolite repression. And by this catabolite repression, or sometimes referred to as the glucose effect, the cell senses how, if it's got glucose available to it. 
And here just to show you what catabolite repression is. Let's say we're looking at this is time and this is the amount of beta galactoside is the product of that, the Z gene, okay? And if we add lactose at this point, we induce the operon, right? The operon is going to be induced by the inducer. And so you're going to get stuck at the production of beta galactosides. And with time, beta galactosides will continue to increase. If at this point you add glucose, you stop making off in any more beta galactosides. It's completely turned off. If you left the glucose out, it will continue to increase. But you put the glucose in and it turns off. This is called, this is the glucose effect or catabolite repression. The cell now realizes there's glucose present, is going to shift over, and is going to use the glucose. It doesn't need to make any more beta galactosides, at least until the glucose runs out, right? All right, so that is what catabolite repression is. And you, again, you typically see this in cat cat catabolic uh, operons. Those are involved in the breakdown of substances. And, and it's not just lactose. It, it's a lot of different operons. We're just using lactose as the prototype. Why doesn't that graph go down? That why doesn't what? The beta galactic graph goes down the baseline again? Here, if there was a lot of glucose around, Eventually it will, because eventually the beta galactosides is going to be, de be destroyed and decay. I mean, all proteins have a certain half-life. So eventually, this would go down. But it just stops, pr stops production, and it's just this level. Eventually, if you waited long enough, this would, would start coming down. You're right. Okay? All right. So how does catabolite repression work? All right. So let's look at the situation first in the absence of glucose. Now, remember... Lactose has got to be present to turn this operon on. So we're talking about a situation where we're dealing with the presence of lactose, but the absence of glucose, all right? So in the presence of lactose, our repressor is going to be inactivated. So this gene, these genes are going to be able to be turned on, right? Because there's no, the, the, the repressor is inactive under these circumstances. All right. So what also happens, this, this second level of control, this catabolite repression, involves cyclic AMP. The cell, in, the enzymes, in, the, in the cell, there's an enzyme, adenyl cyclase, that converts ATP into cyclic AMP. So in the cell, we have some cyclic AMP being made. And there is also in the cell a protein that binds cyclic AMP, called the cap protein, cyclic AMP binding protein. You will also see this protein referred to as the CRP protein, catabolite repressor protein. I tend to use the cap designation, but if you see CRP, that's, that's what it stands for, catabolite repressor protein, or cyclic AMP binding protein. And what happens is that the cyclic AMP in the cell complexes with that cap protein, and it then binds to the promoter of, of these, re, these operons that are sensitive to catabolite repression, and it activates that promoter. So it makes this a better promoter. Without the cap cyclic AMP complex, that promoter is a very low efficiency promoter, and it doesn't work very well. This activates the promoter and then stimulates transcription from this operon. All right, so that you get maximal expression. So to get maximal expression of this operon, you need the presence of lactose in order to inactivate the repressor, and you need the absence of glucose in order to get the formation of this complex to activate this promoter. If you have, uh, uh, so that is when you'll, when you'll get maximal expression. Absence of lactose, uh, presence of lactose, absence of glucose. All right, that's when you turn this operon on, okay? Now, this type of control is referred to, uh, controlled by the catabolite repressor protein or that cap protein, is called positive control because what its job is is to turn on transcription. It activates transcription. It doesn't turn it off. All right, so you have two levels of control, negative control by the repressor, positive control by the cap protein, uh, cyclic AMP complex. All right, that's what you see in the presence of lactose, absence of glucose. What do you see in the presence of lactose and the presence of glucose? Well, in this situation, lactose, of course, will inactivate the repressor, and we will begin to try to activate or to turn on this, this um, induce these genes. But in the presence of glucose, what happens is that the cyclic AMP levels drop in the cell. And the reason that they drop is that this enzyme, adenyl cyclase, is actually in the membrane of the cell. And it is linked to the 
transporter protein that transports glucose into the cell. And so what happens, as glucose is being transported into the cell, this enzyme is inhibited by the transport of glucose because the, the transporter and the adenylcyclase are actually linked and physically linked together. So as glucose is being taken up by the cell, adenylcyclase gets inhibited, so therefore ATP is not converted into cyclic AMP levels, and the cyclic AMP levels start dropping in the cell. Well, if there's no cyclic AMP around, the cap protein is still there, but it cannot form that complex. And if we cannot form the complex, then we cannot activate that promoter. And so this is a very low efficiency promoter. So you don't get much expression of this, this operon. There may be a little bit. I mean, none of these things are you know, all or none. There's, there's going to be a low amount, but it's going to be very, very low amount. And so you get just low level expression of this operon. So in order to get the maximum expression, you need the, the presence of glucose and the absence of, uh, the presence of lactose, absence of glucose. In the presence of lactose and the presence of glucose, you'll go ahead and just make just very, very low levels of exp expression of this, of this operon. Okay? And you can see this in the growth rate of bacteria. If you have bacteria growing on both glucose and galactose, all right, what will happen is they'll utilize the glucose preferentially because this thing is going to, this operon is going to be turned off because of, of catabolite repression, or it's not going to be expressed very well because of catabolite repression. So you'll get the cells will be growing on glucose, and then when the glucose runs out, you'll see them stop growing, because now it's going to take them a while to activate this, to get maximal expression of this operon. So it's, they stop growing for a while, and then they start growing again, because now they're starting using, utilizing the lactose. Okay. All right, all right. So that's those are that's inducible or induction. The any questions on induction? All right. The other major class of genes are the repressible genes or regulation by repression. And these are genes whose expression is turned off by the presence of something in the environment. And our example is going to be tryptophan. There's no reason for the cell to make all the enzymes necessary to make tryptophan if it's got a lot of tryptophan in its environment. And so the cells don't do this. Uh, so let's look at this. And typically, you see this in biosynthetic pathways. Okay, And the co-repressor, the substance that turns uh, turns these genes off is, is typically the end product of the pathway. So in the case of tryptophan, tryptophan is the end product. That is the co-repressor. In, in other operons that are regulated by this type of regulation, for example, the histidine operon, the end product is histidine. Histidine is the one that regulates the operon. Or it acts as the co-repressor. But our system, we'll talk about the tryptophan system. Again, for historical reasons, this was the one that was characterized the most. Uh, so what does this system look like? Again, we have some structural genes. In the case of tryptophan, there are five structural genes. They code for five enzymes that are necessary for the cell to make tryptophan from charismic acid. Um, all right, so there are those five structural genes. And they are regulated by a common promoter. Again, they're all adjacent to each other on the chromosome. Here's the promoter that regulates the expression of these genes. And when this gene, when these genes are transcribed, they are transcribed into a polycystronic messenger RNA that will ultimately get translated into those five proteins. These genes are also under control of a regulatory gene. In the case of the tryptophan, it's called the tryptr gene. So here's the, here's the R gene. And, it, and in this case, it's not the R gene, again, as I said, typically is not even associated with the genes that, that the R gene regulates. It's, it's quite a ways away on the chromosome, actually. All right, so we, this is a regulatory gene. And again, it makes a repressor. It codes for a repressor. It is, it is constitutively expressed. But now the repressor that's made is inactive upon synthesis. All right? We have an operator region right here where the repressor ultimately is going to bind. And in the tryptophan system, there's another piece here that's referred to the, as the leader region. And we'll see what the significance of that leader region is later. Again, here's the operon. It includes the structural genes being regulated as well as the promoter operator region that, that are involved in the regulation. It does not include the regulatory gene. The regulatory gene regulates the operon. Okay, and, the, and in this case, as I said, the repressor is going to be tryptophan, or the co-repressor is going to be tryptophan. 
And, and since this is synthesized as an inactive, sometimes you'll see it referred to as the APO repressor. Okay, so how are these genes regulated? All right, let's look in the absence of tryptophan. In the absence of tryptophan, what we're going to want, we want these genes to be expressed now. All right, so the repressor, remember, we said is synthesized in an inactive conformation. So it's inactive. It cannot bind to this operator, and therefore these genes are expressed. Transcription initiates at that promoter. You make the polycystronic message. The genes are expressed. All right? So in the absence of tryptophan, these genes will be turned on. In the presence of tryptophan, what happens is that tryptophan, the co-repressor, binds to the inactive repressor and now activates it. And so once we've activated the repressor, the repressor can bind to the operator, turning off transcription of those genes. Okay? Again, this is negative control because the, 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 the role of the repressor is ultimately to turn the genes off. Okay? All right. <laughs> so the only difference really between, the main difference between an inducible system and an irrepressible system is that in inducible systems, when the repressor is made, it is made in, in, in an active conformation. Whereas in repressible systems, the, the repressor is made in an inactive conformation and the call repressor activates it. Okay? So that's it, really the only difference. Other than that, the regulation is the same. All right. What is tryptophan used for in the cell? What do you need tryptophan for? To do what? Well, I mean, what do we use tryptophan? What do we, I mean, we do the same thing in bacteria. We're no different. What do we need the tryptophan for? Proteins, right? We need to make proteins. Tryptophan is an amino acid in protein. But what is the substrate for protein synthesis? In other words, do ribosomes use tryptophan? straight free tryptophan when they're making proteins? What do they use? T charred tryptophanyl tRNA. It's the tRNA that is the substrate, right? A charged tRNA. It's not free tryptophan. This kind of control that we just described is a way for the cell to, to assess the level of tryptophan in the environment. But what the cell really wants to know is what is the level of, a level of tryptophanyl tRNA? Because that's what it's going to be using to make proteins. And you can envision a situation where the levels of free tryptophan might be low, but there still might be enough tryptophanyl tRNA around to make proteins. And if that were the situation, why waste all the energy to express these genes when you've got enough tryptophanyl tRNA around to do what you want, to make proteins? And so superimposed upon this type of regulation that we just described, there's another level of regulation by which the cell assesses then the, whether or not it's got enough tryptophanyl tRNA around. And if it does, then it's not going to express these genes, even though there's, there's uh, no tryptophan around. Okay? And that level of is, that control is called attenuation. And attenuation is really nothing else but the premature termination of transcription. That's all attenuation means. Premature termination of transcription. So what's going to happen in this system? We're going to give you the punchline, and then we're going to go and see how we get to that thing. The bottom line is this. If the cell finds that free, free tryptophan is low, it tries to turn on this operon because it says, I need, some, I need uh, to make these enzymes. But if the, then the cell tests after, it's, after it, it tries turning, it begins to turn on this operon. Then the cell tries to assess how much tryptophanyl tRNA is around. If there's enough tryptophanyl tRNA around, then the cell will say, okay, I've got enough to make proteins. I'm not going to express this operon. And it prematurely terminates the transcription of the operon. All right? In contrast, if the cell finds itself in a situation where tryptophan is low, it turns on it tries to turn on this operon and begin to express these genes, and then it tests to see if there's enough tryptophanyl tRNA around. If the answer is no, then it goes on and continues to transcribe this operon. So attenuation occurs only when the cell realizes there's enough tryptophanyl tRNA around to uh, make proteins, and then it prematurely terminates transcription. Okay? 
So that's where we're going to go. And, and that's where this leader region comes in. This leader region is, is involved in the attenuation process. Okay? So we're looking now. What I've done here is just expanded and blown up this, this leader region to talk, to, to talk about some of the characteristics of this region. If you, if you look where the leader is positioned, first of all, here's the first gene of the operon, the, the, uh, the first structural gene of the operon, the E gene, okay? The rest of them I didn't just show here. They're all out here, okay? Here's the promoter and there's the operator. And the region leader is between in here, uh, between the operator and the E gene. Transcription actually begins someplace about here. So the, what that means is that this leader region is, in fact, transcribed. All right, so we're, we're, we're going to transcribe this leader region. Now, if you look at the sequence of nucleotides in that leader region, there is actually a codon, when this, when this leader will be transcribed, there is a codon that is the start signal for protein synthesis. That AUG is the, is the signal for ribosomes to start translation at this point. And if you then go down and, and read the, continue down the message, Further on down the road, there is a stop codon for protein synthesis. So in other words, built into this little, this leader region, there is actually a mini gene. It can, be trans it can start translation and stop translation. It's really small. It's only about 15 amino acids in length. So this, this, is, a, this is a mini gene that is going to code for a peptide of only about 15, um, 15 amino acids. Now, if you look at the C, what amino acids are encoded in that gene, they're, they vary, in, in, and I don't remember what exactly these things are, but the important ones are, is that right about there, there are two tryptophan codons, and they're actually adjacent to each other. Now, tryptophan actually is a pretty rare amino acid in proteins. In a typical amino, in a typical protein, say, of about 100 amino acids, you may have three or four tops tryptophan. It's not a very common amino acid. And here we've got a little peptide that's only 15 amino acids long that's got two tryptophanes. All right? All right. Another feature about this thing. Oh, let me, let me just point out here. I've, I don't know if I've put some boxes here. These boxes are now, are now at this point do not imply exons and introns. They don't exist. I'm just showing you boxes. And what these, the reason I'm showing these in boxes is that if you look at the sequences in these areas of the, of the message, it turns out that there's actually homology between some of these, these things so that theoretically these things can come back and base pair and, and form uh, double-stranded uh, RNAs and, and give, give you some secondary structure. And that the, our, the stem loop structures are like this. That region one actually has homology with region two. So theoretically, this message can fold in upon itself, and this, this can, region one can base pair with region two because they're complementary sequences and form this sort of stem loop structure. Region three also has some homology with region four, so you can form this structure, all right? But in addition, region two also has homology with region three. So theoretically, you can form this structure as well. Now, clearly, some of these are mutually exclusive because if this thing forms, if one base pairs with two, then two will not be available to base pair with three. So these, this one and this one are mutually exclusive. All right? And similarly, this one and this one are mutually exclusive because if this forms, this cannot form or vice versa. All right? So we have some mutually exclusive secondary structure that can form in the, in, the in, the, in the messenger RNA if these things start base pairing with each other. Okay. The next piece of the puzzle is I need to remind you that, that in bacteria, transcription and translation are coupled. And the reason that they're coupled is because bacteria don't have nuclear membranes. So as a gene become, be, is, begins to be transcribed in bacteria, once the message is, made, is being made, even as it is being made by the RNA polymerase, there's nothing to stop a ribosome from jumping on and translating that message. Because they're, so the two processes are coupled. We obviously can't do that. We've got to take our messages, export them from the nucleus so that they get, can get to the ribosomes. Bacteria don't have to do that. So they couple transcription and translation. All right. With all those pieces then, let's put the thing together and to see how attenuation works. All right, and we'll start off with the situation. Now, remember, tryptophan has got to be 
low or, or apt, low so that, that this, this operon gets turned on and we begin to transcribe this leader region, okay? All right, so that's the first requirement. Tryptophan has to be low, so we start to transcribe this region. And let's consider first a situation where even though tryptophan is low, the levels of tryptophanyl tRNA are high enough to make protein. What happens? All right, so this message starts being made. And here's the leader transcript. I'm only just showing the transcript for the leader region. Well, it's, again, since, since transcription and translation are coupled, what's going to happen is as RNA polymerase is transcribing this message, or is transcribing the DNA and making this message, ribosomes jump on as soon as they, they see that start site. And so the ribosomes are sort of following the RNA polymerase along. As the RNA polymerase is making the message, the ribosomes are translating this message. All right? So the ribosomes are jumping on here, and eventually the, the ribosome reaches these two tryptophan codons that are in this little mini gene. Well, once it reaches this, the true levels of tryptophanyl tRNA are high enough, it can translate proteins, so it translates those two, pro two proteins, and the ribosomes ultimately come to this stop site. So here we have the ribosome reaching the stop site. And of course, more than one ribosome is going to bind, uh, start here, and they just sort of follow each other along. And so you end up with a situation like this, because the, the ribosome, the first ribosome can actually reach this point, all right? Notice what's happened. Because this, this region is being covered with the ribosomes, that prevents region one from binding with region two. All right, in addition, region two is partially blocked. That blocks region two from binding with region three. So the only base pair structure that can form, only secondary structure that can form is this region three base pairing with region four. A, a base pair that looks like this, a stem loop structure followed by a series of U's, which is what you see in this message, that is the signal for bacteria to terminate transcription. This is an, called an attenuator. So transcription then ends. So what happens is the RNA, remember, the, the ribosomes are following the RNA polymerase along. When, once this structure is formed, RNA polymerase is destabilized and it falls off the DNA and transcription ends. So we attenuate transcription because the cell realized, even though the tryptophan was low, tryptophanyl tRNA was high enough to make these proteins, okay? And right, let's look at the other situation where tryptophan is low, we turn on this operon, we begin transcribing the operon, but now tryptophanyl tRNA levels are also low so that we can't make protein. So what happens there? Well, again, this leader gets transcribed because tryptophan is no longer there. We're going to turn the operon on, so we transcribe this region. The ribosomes, as soon as this, uh, this uh, start signal is, is available, the ribosomes jump on and they start translating. But now they, the ribosomes reach those two tryptophan codons, but they can't translate them because there's no, not enough tryptophanyl tRNA around. So they arrest here. So the ribosomes get stopped here. The RNA polymerase continues to go on and it's, it makes region two and region three. And as soon as region two and three are made, they can base pair to each other. If region, if region three is tied up with region two, it can never bind with region four, so we never generate the signal that says trans, stop transcription. And so the attenuator or the, the stop, sig, stop transcription signal never is generated. The RNA polymerase just continues to go on and, and transcribes all the genes. Okay? So essentially what the cell does is it tries to make a small peptide, a test peptide, and if it can make it, it, it realizes, I got enough tryptophanyl tRNA around, I'll attenuate transcription, and attenuation occurs. In, if, it's, if it cannot translate this little test peptide, then it goes on and transcribes the whole operon, all the structural genes of the operon, and then the cell makes more, it makes the enzymes that are necessary for generating more tryptophan, okay? All right, this is level by regulation by attenuation. Now, I, got, I hope that this works. It works on mine at home. I, sometimes it, we're going to see if we got to get a little movie that try, try to, to say what I just said in a pictorial way. I got to I got to stay here and work it. All right.
All right, there's, there's the leader peptide. There's the first gene of the operon, RNA polymerase, the ri ribosomes, okay? The RNA polymerase, when tryptophan is absent, is going to start transcribing this region. It's going to just blow up and show you where those two tryptophan codons are. Ribosomes are going to jump on and follow the RNA polymerase. And then we'll, let's look first at the... Now, this has trip levels. It really is more appropriate to say tryptophanyl tRNA levels. So it's, this is trip, high tryptophanyl tRNA levels. So what's going to happen? The ribosome is going to go on and cover up regions 1 and region 2. That allows region 3 and region 4 to base pair. And that's the signal for attenuation. And attenuation stops. The ribosome, this ribosome can come off. The RNA polymerase is going to come off. And we attenuate. On the other hand, I'm going to have to go through all this part again. Okay, again, this should this be better to read tryptophanyl tRNA levels low. The ribosome is going to stall there. Now that lets region 2 and 3 base pair blocking, trend, blocking the formation of the attenuator signal. This ribosome can come off, but now you've got that... that uh, this structure formed. Uh, new ribosomes will jump up by trippy and, and you'll go ahead and, and transcribe the whole message. Okay, any questions on attenuation? Yes. Yes, because attenuation is the premature termination of transcription. All right, so that, yeah, that, that is exactly what happens. You terminate transcription prematurely. Yeah, it, it's just going to be degraded and, and, and lost. Uh, eventually, you'll, re, you'll reuse those nucleotides. Okay? All right. Now, I just want to just a couple words and then we'll be done on regulation of enzyme, enzyme activity. We're not going to really spend a lot of time on this. I just want to just remind you, I don't want to give you the impression that bacteria only regulate genes by trans at the transcription level. That's not true. We do regulate, the bacteria do regulate at the level of translation sometimes. And there's also regulation of enzymatic activity. Everything that you heard in biochemistry, feedback inhibition occurs, post-translational modifications of proteins by either phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, adenylation, deadenylation, regulating activity, all of this applies to bacteria as well. They do all of this. In fact, most of that stuff was actually first discovered in bacterial systems, uh, not in eukaryotic systems. So everything that you've heard about regulation of activity also applies to bacteria. All right. We'll stop. And I 